everyone, my name is Sam and thanks for checking out this video. Make sure to hit the subscribe button down below and get the bell notification and give the video a thumbs up or a thumbs down whenever you're feeling today. So I apologize if I seem very kind of pissed off right now. I literally just filmed this and then plugged something into my computer and my dogs walked across the keyboard and deleted everything I just did. So I'm literally doing this for the second time today and it's already been a very long day. So actually first thing before I forget because this is one thing I did forget to film 20 minutes ago um, was the review that I wanted to do for Dread Nation by Justina Ireland. I'm still, my friend that I was going to have read it because he is specifically of indigenous descent is currently in Peru, so I can't get him to read it for me right now. But just, again, it was just, there's a lot kind of to unpack it, so I'm not totally sure that I can totally do it justice. But I just found that I, I, I loved the book except for one thing, but I think the one thing stood out for me. So if you don't know, Dread Nation is a book where there is a civil war where zombies took place. And because of the zombies, the civil war, as we know, it ends and switches so that they start training indigenous people and black people in the United States to be zombie slayers kind of thing. But they are still very much under the thumb of the white population. And I thoroughly enjoyed the book it, on its own. I liked the characters. I liked the dialogue for the most part. The setting was really fun. It was a little bit slow at the beginning, but I liked getting to know the characters. It touches a lot about kind of like the hierarchy within being black. Because I mean, like I'm like the whitest person. I'll, I'll, I mean, look at me. But one of the things that kind of came up quite a few times in the book was talking about being passing white. And that's something that I had never thought of until a couple of years ago. I had a friend from South Africa that was talking about that, that he is technically like kind of seen as like white black in that where he lived. And I, that was not something I was aware of. So it was really interesting that that was brought up. I think my biggest issue is, and it's simply because of my job. I don't know that I would have had the lens that I had if A, I hadn't gotten the book through work. So that was one of the reasons why I specifically had that kind of focus on. But it's just my job in general. It's been very eye-opening about decolonizing things. And I don't know the United States. I don't live there. I live in Canada. But in the last couple of years, we've had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which I am going to link in the description down below, about how Indigenous people in Canada are still to this day treated. And we did commit essentially a genocide. We committed a bunch of horror. While World War II was going on, we were trying to legitimately wipe out an entire race of human, human beings in, in Canada. And we're still trying to get people to acknowledge that that happened and that racism still exists in Canada. It's a big problem here. And that's what I do a lot of my job focusing on is, at least in library world, decolonizing space and decolonizing collections, getting books off the shelves that really have no m merit or value anymore are just plain racist or perpetuate stereotypes that are just blatantly wrong. And we want to get more of their voices in it. So I was really excited that A, Justina Ireland is an author of color. I'm all for that, better representation in the publishing industry. And then I was really excited when I found out that there was going to be an Indigenous character. I will say, though, the author's note does specify that she found out about, in Canada, we called them residential schools. They called them, I think, industrial Native American schools there. But they seem to have done pretty similar things. We just did the more extreme, a lot of actions. But Justina Ireland found out about those, and that was what gave her the inspiration. So I saw that, and I was expecting a lot of rap. That was, I was very disappointed just on that, that there was one Indigenous character. He didn't get a ton of lines. I think maybe he spoke four or five times. I love that she gave him a specified band because we homogenize those groups an awful lot of their indigenous. Well, there's Plains Cree, there's Stony Nakoda, there's like, there's the Mohawk, then there's Navajo. And like within those, there's lots of different things. And because they're split up on reserves too, they're kind of their own entities now as well. And they all have different languages and some are nomadic and some are not. And they all have different stories and just societal setups. So I was really happy that that was at least acknowledged. I had issue with, and I don't think it was done with ill intent, um, especially after I read the author's note, because it felt, before I read the author's note, it felt like the random character was just thrown in to add some more diversity to it. At the end, at, at the author's note, I don't know if maybe there were more before and it was edited out, or maybe she just focused so much on different parts of the book that she kind of forgot about it. I also am not trying to call the book or, you know, the author racist and it's not I didn't get that intent I think it was just maybe a little bit of neglect or oversight a little bit that there's only one indigenous character and this isn't honestly I don't consider this a spoiler his only role is to help kidnap and transport someone 
to a different place on behalf of the white person. There are already a lot of stereotypes within history. You can look at a bunch of different like um, posters in history of like natives kidnapping people and taking them off and that kind of stuff. And that's all he does. He never comes back. He never gets to redeem himself. You know, I think his big redeeming moment, if we could even call that, was like he left weapons for them to use at the end, but he never knew that that was going to, he never kind of went out of his way or stuff. It just, it just really, I, I read that and my heart just dropped and I kept waiting for something to happen or change or something. And it just, the book ended. And I was very disheartened and saddened by that. Um, and I've, I'd said that in, in a couple groups and someone had made some comments of, well, it's a minor character. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if, if would you have the same mentality if all of them, all the other characters were, you know, white and indigenous, and that was done so that a one black character in the background had done the same thing. That's not acceptable to me. That's creating a race hierarchy, which is not, not what the entire, you know, representation, representation was about. Also note that that was an arc. So I don't know if that was fixed in the final copy. If you have read it and you noticed something or you think that I missed something, please let me know in the comment section down below. I would love to get a different perspective on this. Like I said, I am white. So I mean, I am of a privileged position. However, it's something that I've been re really focusing heavily on. And I don't think people do a lot of the time with ill intent or even realizing that they're doing it. But something like the only indigenous character having very little speaking role, being shoved off screen pretty early on in the book and being used literally to just kidnap and transport characters. It doesn't, it, that doesn't sit right with me. That seems that's, that's, that's problematic in my eyes. So I, for that reason too, I was like, I, I would give it a five out of five stars otherwise. I loved the book otherwise. So that's why I had such a hard time reading it. And I don't even know if I'm ever going to actually put like a star rating up. I've just left it blank right now. But yeah, that's my long winded answer there. Moving on to this week's reads. I read Obsidio. This is the third and final book in the Illuminate Files series by Jay Kristoff and Amy Kaufman. I'm so sad this is over. This is one of the best conclusions to a series I've ever read. It's really, really solid. If you liked Illuminate, if you liked Gemini, I assume you're going to like this. A lot of the dialogue is still really funny. The chemistry between characters and then the, the romantic relationships and friendships as well is really good. It's consistent. The comedy and the dialogue are still there. Uh, I love Katty and, Katie and Ezra so much. There's so much chaos and science going on. This, again, really, really good fast pace. I honestly continuously forget at the at, through Gemini and Obsidio that at the beginning they t there's like an interaction action of like this is a you know a, a a trial a court tell us what happened and then you jump into the story i constantly forget that they're telling us a story and then you get to the end you're like of course they're still alive they were telling the story why did i forget this so i absolutely love this it's not i don't think it gave me the same book hangover as gemina did just because there's conclusions in this one whereas gemina didn't but you get to like compile all of the characters and the relationships and the information that we've gotten from illuminating gemina and get to the end and try and find justice against Baytech who has been create, doing some whole on like genocidal crap and horrible people and they're trying to both survive save as many people as they can avoid Aiden going full on like killing people in the name of you know math and statistics and also trying to make sure that they retain as much information and documentation so that if they do survive that they can try Baytech for murder so there is tons of stuff going on and I absolutely love this book and it was so 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 good and I'm so sad this series is over but I'm glad and I read it and I'm gonna continuously reread this series so five out of five stars. Then I read Rose Under Fire by Elizabeth Wine. This is the companion book to Codename Verity which I read in late 2017. I also own the prequel uh, novel that's The Pearl Thief, I think it is, that I'm going to read soon, I hope. This one didn't destroy my heart the way Codename Verity did, simply because of like the ending results for a lot of the different things. But it's really, really interesting. So our main character, Rose, is a pilot in World War II for the, uh, for the British. And she goes, well, she's flying technically over France, but she gets essentially like captured uh, by German planes and taken behind enemy lines and taken in as a concentration camp prisoner. And it's very interesting that you can see very distinct differences in how she is treated. And she full on acknowledges that in this book, that even though she was prisoner at a concentration camp for, I think like a year and a half-ish it was, um, where she interacts with other prisoners, she is aware that she didn't even have the worst of it. She is a American flight 
uh, or she's of American descent uh, flying for the British, and she's a female pilot. And they actually, when she gets captured, you can see that they treat her with much more respect than they treat uh, any Jewish prisoner ever. And But then you, through her, you get to interact with other people in this camp. And they have different roles, and there's like, there's the prison guard role, and there's like Jewish working for the Germans to survive, and you meet prisoners of a lot of experiments. One of the characters, all, named also named Rose, she is was physically mutilated through the experiments. So there's lots of different dynamics going on in this, and we get to to know all of these different places and see the difference in treatment going on. And it's just really interesting and so incredibly well written. And all the characters, even if they're they're not perfect, but I mean, you still want to root for them. And all of them bring different dynamics to the table. And some people sacrifice themselves in the name of other people. And it's just really, really well written. It does a really good job, I think, of bringing up the issue of PTSD, it, especially in something like this, as well as like, we, we don't know what it was like coming out of a concentration camp. But she even specifies that we go through at the end a lot of the, the trials and accusations of war crimes against a lot of the German officers. And she even specifies that she doesn't really want to, she uses poetry to get out what she felt and thought and went through, but she doesn't even have the opportunity to go to war, go to like, and present in a court of what she went through because she was under different circumstances as everyone else. But she's also very aware of like, she didn't get the worst of it. And these people deserve to have their voices heard. But she even, like, even getting the better end of the things that she did, she's not even still able to verbalize things. She can't actually, even she can't even actually say her poetry out loud in public. So it was just really interesting. Five out of five stars. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Really excited for The Pearl Thief. If you like historical fictions, give this one a go for sure. Then I read The Ark that I had for The Tattooist of Auschwitz by Heather Morris. I ended up giving this book, I think, a three-ish out of five stars. I didn't love it. I also didn't hate it either. I read it immediately after Rose Under Fire, which is an amazingly written book. Like, the writing is just am truly amazing. And unfortunately, the writing and the execution of this book was just not up to par on that. So I just by automatically default was kind of comparing it to that. It's it's quite interesting, though. It's the true story of one of our characters who is from, he was a Jewish descent, but from Slovakia. And he is kind of the victim to when the Nazis invade that country and require them to forfeit all of their Jewish citizens. So he goes in and he's taken in. And I had I knew that they did get tattoos of their number and that's how they were identified. But I had never thought about who did the tattoo of it and in Austria and Auschwitz and Birkenhaus what's the I can't pronounce remember how to pronounce it properly but you know the notorious concentration camp the prisoners were actually the ones doing that which is kind of like a really messed up thing to have them do but it also really challenges that idea of like do you go and just be a prisoner and just do like forced labor or if you were given some perks like being able to take that role on and you get safety and you get extra food and extra shelter and some extra privileges and being treated a little bit more than like scum would you take it and what would you do with it and this character takes that opportunity and then he takes someone else on as his apprentice in order to kind of save him and then he passes along a lot of the benefits that he gets of like extra food of being able to smuggle things into the camp and he he just has privileges that others didn't and it was quite interesting to see that I honestly don't know what I would do in a situation like that if I would even be able to take on those extra roles it's just it was just a very up, messed up world, and we've done some pretty messed up things in our history. And this was just one of those things. I think, like, the real hard part that I had with this book was the romance aspect of it. I know that the tr it is a true story. The main character meets his wife in the concentration camp, and they do fall in love there. And once they leave, they get married, and, and they have a good long life together. And that's where the story does come from, is, is that gentleman and his son. Um, but... They go through a lot after Auschwitz too, but it was just, I felt like it was, the romance was written very awkwardly, or it, it just took me out of the setting a lot of the time. It just didn't seem to fit right with what was going on. I, I don't even know how to totally explain it, and... Yeah, so I mean, that was my, my big problem. But overall, it was actually still like a pretty interesting read, the topic. And I always love getting to hear those stories. I think it's important that we that we encapsulate those stories and keep them so that when they do pass on, like this gentleman has and his wife, 
that we still have that and hopefully we can avoid making the same mistakes. Then I read Crest by Marissa Meyer. This is the third book in the Lunar Chronicles series, and I'm rereading the series this year. This follows Cress, which is our Rapunzel kind of character, and she was a shell from the moon, and Lavana had Sybil, her kind of like minion, take some of the shells, and she is put on a satellite in the middle of like space by herself on a planet, and is used to hack and kind of like bug places that Lavana wants bug to get information on it. And she's really honestly emotionally abused by Sybil. And she, we find out though, has helped Cinder and Cress in the past few books. Um, and we finally get to meet her. So it was really interesting. She gets, comes down from that satellite onto the planet Earth. And you see her try and like figure out, she's just so naive and so love struck with some characters based on things that she thought she knew. And it's just seeing her go through different things. There's a lot of adventuring. There's a big lineage reveal, which I honestly did not see coming the first time I read this series. And we just keep building on this whole, how do we save Kay, Kai from Lavana, the marriage that he's kind of being forced into, or she's going to like continue spreading a plague and withhold the cure. So it's really, really interesting. I love it. I still love Scarlet, I think most, but this is a really good, really, really good story. I just want Scarlet and Wolf to be back together. That's probably why I like Scarlet more than this book, because Scarlet and Wolf are split up uh, pretty pretty early on, I think, actually, in this book here. So I'm really excited to get Winter and Stars Above on my probably May TBR and then be all done with that series. Then I read The Diabolic uh, by S.J. S. Kinsade. I honestly don't even know why I randomly just picked this up. I was finally just like, you know what, you're gonna read it. It's just, you need to read it. And honestly, really happy I did. I think I ended up giving this like a four and a half out of five stars. The only thing that deterred me was the romance. I found it quite cheesy and a little bit too easy. But other than that, it was really, really fun. Our main character is actually what they call a diabolic, but she's like essentially like a genetically mutated like robot and she's supposed to protect kind of who she's been bonded to. And she's been bonded to a character who is the daughter of a kind of lowish level politician. And that low level politician has in the recent years pissed off the emperor of their whole kind of realm, society, social sort solar system I don't even know but he's kind of a sociopath the emperor constantly just wipes up people he's been killing off family members that he thinks will even remotely threaten him for his role as emperor so the father is a big advocate for science and innovation to in order to sustain their continued model he knows that they need to however the emperor also acknowledges that science and revolu science and technology revolution tends to go hand in hand with political revolution which would threaten him which you know fair enough so he's been bit barring it and has actually been imposing the same religion in all the areas that he rules that he abides by that benefits his system so he uh gets pissed off with that dad and says you know what then i'm gonna take your daughter send her to court and normally when that happens, the daughters get killed when they go to court. So instead they send their diabolic because no one actually knows what their daughter looks like. So they send her kind of as a protection and lots of stuff goes on. There's some really messed up things going on in the court. And you find out about like a revolution and there's coups and like, oh, the last third of this book is so intense. There are so much, there's so much backstabbing and death. I remember, I think in my review, I quoted of like, that's a bloody ending and by bloody i mean like that was a really good ending as well as bloody there's lots of death in it <laughs> so i am really really curious the very last backstabbing was like so good and i it, it really kept me like but wait so the next book the sequel is called the empress so female but which female i don't understand what's happening here so i'm really excited to read the empress soon and i think it's a, there's going to be three books out so i'm gonna keep going with this series i really enjoy it and if you're like me and have had this on your bookshelf for like two years and haven't touched it, do yourself a favor and pick it up. I think, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. And last but not least, I read The Alchemist by Michael Scott. It is the first book in the Secrets of the Immortal Nicholas, in the Immortal Nicholas Flamel series. Technically, it's actually YA, but having read it now, I actually would classify this as a middle grade. It's a little bit of YA, but it's honestly more middle grade than anything. There's lots of Percy Jackson vibes in this, and there's the use of, like, the Chosen Ones trope, as well as the come to the dark side kind of thing from Star Wars, which I really, really loved. But our main characters are Josh and Sophie. They are twins living in San Francisco with their grandmother at the time. Their parents are archaeologists, so they're currently away on a dig, and they're used to moving around because of their parents' job. And they're at in San Francisco where they both have summer jobs. They're about 15 years old. 
Sophie works at a coffee shop and across the street is a bookstore where Josh works at for his boss Nicholas and at the beginning all of a sudden things go amiss when Nicholas is, and the bookstore are attacked and there's magical powers used and they don't know what's going on and things evolve, evolve from there. There's you know finding out that they're the chosen ones but there's prophecies about a twin that glow of different auras and they tend to coincide with that so they have to unlock their magic and Nicholas Flamel's wife gets stolen but she has powers too so we, we slip back and forth actually through quite a few different POVs and there's just a continuous development of new parts of the magical realm that they're in there were a few times when things happened where I was like isn't that awfully convenient that you didn't think to mention that three chapters before when you should have but all of a sudden this person has this magical power which came in key when this thing happened but other than that I really enjoyed it the pacing was a little bit slow in some of the spots but in the end I pretty pretty thoroughly thoroughly really liked this book so I'm going to definitely pick up the sequel The Magician probably in May or so so those are all of the books that I read this week let me know in the comment section down below what you read this week and if you've read any of these books and loved them or hated them as well as if I've convinced you to pick up any of these books and add them to your TBR make sure to check the description box down below for links to all of the Goodreads pages for these books as well as links to all of my social media if you follow me I will follow you 